Thank you, Dima, and thanks to all. It's a, a great honor to be here, and I feel honored that we started with a song which I really love, Bella Ciao, <laughs> and uh, it's a song about our fight against fascism, being Italy, the country which invented fascism. And I think this case really goes to the heart of what a totalitarian state is. And the first victim of totalitarianism, the, first, the, very, first, uh, the very first features, the very first thing that may, should make people horrified about uh, the direction, yeah, the direction taken by, okay? Is that, okay? The direction taken by society is the destruction of freedom of the press. That's how Mussolini started. One of the very first things he did was to establish who was a journalist, who was a legitimate journalist, and who was not. Because that's how you control who published, what get published. So when I, hear, I saw the US government say in its indictment, in its press conference, for um, when the charges against Julian Assange were, were basically unsealed, uh, Julian Assange is not a journalist, is not a legitimate journalist. It reminds me of the dark days when the fascist regime was in charge of deciding who is a journalist and who is not a journalist. And it reminds me of those dark days. Obviously, we are not in, in a fascist society. OK. Obviously, we are not in a fascist society. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here discussing the Julian Assange WikiLeaks case. But what is happening in this case should, should scare everyone. And I'm the first to be really scared about what I have seen, what I have witnessed in this case. I have been dead from the very beginning, very, very beginning, 2009, when very few knew about WikiLeaks. Very, they hadn't published their bombshells, like collateral murder, which made them, which made them famous around the world. And it all started because uh, one of my sources, in, one of my journalistic sources had stopped talking to me. She was convinced she was under illegal interception. And of course, there is no way to know whether you are under illegal interception. It must be, it could be paranoia. It could be <laughs> a real paranoia, or it could be real. There's no way to know whether you are under illegal interception. So that source, that journalistic source, at that time I was working, I was already working for the Italian leading news magazine, L'Espresso, progressive news magazine, heavy focus on um, corruption, mafia, um, exposing uh, uh, threat, fascist, fascist threats. And I was working for L'Espresso and that source that never ever believed me anything. I still, after 15 years, I don't know what she knew. Basically changed my journalism forever. Usually our journalistic sources change our journalism because of what they tell us, what they reveal to us. But in that, in that case, my source changed my journalism forever for what she didn't tell me. She didn't want to talk to me. She didn't want to meet me. She was convinced we were under control. We were uh, followed. We were spies. So she didn't want to meet me. And it was at that point, precisely at that point, it was 2008, one year before I, I was contacted by Wiflix. It was at that point that I realized that I needed better source protection because what we have, what we all use, telephones, 
emails are very easy to penetrate, especially if you have money, if you have good technologies. So in these days, very, very easy to penetrate these <laughs> technologies. They are no longer suitable for the 21st century. And even if they are used in all your newsroom around the world, the, most of the journalists use telephones, most use emails. So I, I realized I needed better source protection. And for me, it was natural to look at cryptography because I'm a, I'm a mathematician. Before journalism, I, I got a degree in maths. So I knew there was this thing called cryptography, but I knew very little. I just had, uh, you know, uh, theoretical knowledge. I didn't have any uh, practical skill in using cryptography. You use cryptography, uh, as I said, all the time, you use cryptography even if you don't realize it, that you are using it. You use uh, WhatsApp. You use, uh, you know, systems for um, making uh, home banking. You don't go to your bank physically. You don't go to your hospital to download your uh, medical records. You do it from the internet or someone do it for you from the internet. And they can do that because cryptography allows you to do this kind of operation without all others seeing your medical records, all others accessing all bank records. That's cryptography. And you know, at that time, there was nothing. There was no WhatsApp. There was no, was no signal. There was nothing. There was just, cryptography was really unfriendly. Very few knew that cryptography existed at all. Just the military, computer scientists, mathematicians, spies, diplomats, which use cryptography to protect their communication. And there was only one or media organization in the world using cryptography. And that media organization was not the New York Times, it was not the Washington Post, it was not the Guardian. That media organization was WikiLeaks. And one of when one of my sources in the field of cryptography told me, you should have a look on that bunch of lunatics. It was joking, but he appreciated the work of Wikileaks. I didn't know Wikileaks. I didn't know Julian Assange. And that source put Wikileaks on my radar screen. I established the first contact with Wikileaks. I was deeply impressed by what they were doing. They were able to obtain documents which no one was able to obtain. Why? And the explanation was cryptography. In the darkness of state secrecy, many, many, there were many who disagree with the extremely brutal uh, techniques and uh, um, tactics used during the war on terror torture, brutal torture, uh, extrajudicial killing. In the darkness of secrecy, there were many, both on the left and on the right, because <laughs> it, even if you are a right-wing person, it doesn't mean you are a torturer or you stand by torture, of course. Willing to send these documents anonymously, protected by cryptography. And this is why they receive this documentation. And one of the very first documents which deeply impressed me was the Guantanamo Manual. Guantanamo Manual about the military task force operating Guantanamo, which no other organization, civil rights, human rights organization had been able to obtain. Not even the American Civil Liberties Union, the ACLU, which have tried over and over and they are good lawyers and they have good uh, litigation <laughs> capability, and yet they had been unable to obtain it. But Wikileaks obtained it. Wikileaks published it. And not only that, what also deeply impressed me was the fact that they had obtained it. And when the Pentagon had told them, please remove it, because you are not authorized to publish it, they said no. I mean, I was, <laughs> I was so impressed because I have been a journalist for the last 21 years, 16 in the field of journalism, uh, investigative journalism, and believe me, I have known 
very, very, very few people willing to say no to the Pentagon. So that courage deeply impressed me, deeply impressed me. And uh, since then, the first one time I worked as a media partner with them was 2009, when they called me in the middle of the night because they had an important file and they want some help to verify it and to check, to understand the local context. And I understood they were working as a media organization because this is what media organizations do. They receive documents, they establish whether they are true, and they establish if they are in the public interest or whether it's not gossip, it's not silly things. And if it's true and in the public interest, they publish. So since 2009, I work on all their documents, all their secret documents, especially those US secret documents for which Julian Assange risks 175 years. I think this case is absolutely outrageous. I here I have published the very same documents for the last decade. I was never arrested. I was never put in prison. He has paid for all of us. It's absolutely, it's absolutely crucial that we win this case and we free Julian Assange. Because if the government can win this case, if they can put in prison a journalist for revealing war crimes, our society will go direct straightly to full authoritarian. So this case goes beyond Julian Assange. Of course, of course goes <laughs> his life and his imbalance. So <laughs> the first thing is to <laughs> save his life. But this case is about the kind of society in which we want to live. Do we want to live in a society in which you can expose war crimes, you can expose torture. This is what a democracy is. In a totalitarian state, you cannot expose state criminality at the highest level. They kill you. They send you killers. They send you in a prison, a dungeon for life. In a democracy, it must be possible. So this is why I take every opportunity and I want to thank Deepa and you all for being here to uh, tell you that we have few months, few months to save him. And if he leaves this country, if he leaves Europe, he's gone. If he extradited to the US, he will be his death. And with him, it will be the death of free, the free press and the death of your right to know what the government is doing, the darkness of secrecy with your money as a taxpayer and in your name. Thank you.